Okay. Before I dive into uh, the cesspool called Russell Meade, uh, Ina asked me to uh, say why Thelma Todd was killed. Uh, strictly speaking, it was, I, I would, putting on my lawyer's hat, I, I would say it was probably manslaughter, not murder. Uh, she lived with Roland West. Uh, they, for propriety's sake, because he was married to someone else, uh, they had a uh, large sliding door between their apartments in this, in this, between their bedrooms in an apartment above uh, a restaurant on Pacific Coast Highway that she and West owned together. Uh, he was a possessive man and she was a free spirit and there came a time when she was supposed to she'd been invited to a party at a nightclub, the Trocadero and he wanted her to be around at the, at the restaurant because he uh, had an appointment to see the Skouris brothers the Skouris brothers are the people who wound up buying a controlling interest in uh, 20th century Fox pit I wouldn't expect many people to know that these days. And he asked her to be home by 10 o'clock, and she said, no, I'll come and go as I please. And he said, 10 o'clock. She said, 11 o'clock. He said, 10 o'clock. She said, midnight. He said, 10 o'clock. She said, maybe I won't come home at all. She got home about 3 o'clock in the morning. Her driver, she had a chauffeur, she, uh, had been forbidden to drive by the studio. She had a bad habit of wrapping cars around lampposts or uh, palm trees. Uh, her driver usually walked up a dozen steps to the door to the apartment, but this time she told him not to because she was expecting a scene. So he left, and he, she found out in a moment that he had locked it, Roland West had locked her out. He had thrown the bolt on the inside. So she pounds on the door and pounds on the door and pounds on the door. And finally, he answers and he said, I told you to come home at 11, 10 o'clock. So now you, 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 you're you just going to have to fend for yourself. And they had a big fight through the door, a screaming match. And she said, I'll just go to another party. She starts to climb these steps. Roland West throws on some clothes and follows her. When he gets to the top of the hill where the garage is located, she's already behind the wheel of her car and the engine is running. He locks the door to the garage to teach her a lesson. And then he goes back down and goes to sleep. The next morning, which is Sunday morning, about 8 o'clock, he walks back up the steps, uh, locks the garage and finds her dead. He takes the lock this garage was rarely locked, almost ever. He takes the lock off the hasp, goes back down, and starts calling around to establish an alibi. So that's what happened. Let's go to Russell Means. Uh, Russell Means was, in his day, probably the most famous living American Indian. He died about two and a half years ago. In 1970s, he was a leader, 60s and 70s actually, a leader of what became known as the American Indian Movement, which was a, essentially a very militant civil rights group advocating for Native American rights. He and Russell Banks, excuse me, Dennis Banks, were the two leaders of the takeover of, by the American Indian Movement of the Wounded Knee Village on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in 1973. When I met him, he had just finished his first movie. The movie was called Last of the Mohicans, and he was the second lead after Daniel Day-Lewis. I suspect even before then he was very full of himself, but I don't know because I didn't know him before that. My agent asked me to come to a meeting at the Spitfire restaurant on the Santa Monica Airport, which was five minutes from my house. And I met him and my agent and a man named Quay Hayes. 
Clay Hayes was a uh, young man who was had started a celebrity book publishing company, and this was too big a book for him to publish. He just didn't have the money to properly promote it. So he decided to serve as packager. And as packager, he would give a completed, edited manuscript to a publisher. And the editing would be done by a man by the name of Murray Fisher. Murray Fisher was uh, Alex Haley's editor on Roots. And also before that, on the autobiography of Malcolm X. And before that, Alex Haley wrote the first Playboy interview, the very first one. It wasn't the Playboy interview until uh, he got a guy who n nobody ever talked to, who wouldn't talk to reporters, to talk to him. And in a moment, I'll think of his name. Rockley. Hmm? Rock, the uh, head of the American Was Nazi it? Party. The head of the American Nazi Party, wasn't it? George Lincoln Rockwell? Yeah, George uh, Lincoln Rockwell. George Lincoln Rockwell? No, no, not oh, George Lincoln Rockwell. Uh, oh, well. His most famous album, in my mind, he's, he's a, he's a uh, musician. Sketches of Spain. He's a, a uh, Miles Davis. Davis. Miles Davis. Thank you yeah. very much. Oh. Having a senior moment. <laughs> Started about a year now. Uh, Miles Miles Davis sat for an interview with Alex Haley, and when that came in over the transom at Playboy, where Murray Fisher was an editor. They created the Playboy interview to have a way to show this. So he's a very good editor and they learned a great deal from him. But he was also in the early stages of Alzheimer's and he didn't know it. So after a while, I became a parent, he had serious memory problems. Uh, when I met Russell, it was at this restaurant and I never got a chance to ask him anything. He just started making statements. And some of these statements sounded very outrageous. Uh, and many of them were partly true, some were not true. But most of them, even the most outrageous ones, turned out to be true. What I knew about American Indians at that point was what I had seen in the movies. And I knew that most of that was crap. It just wasn't true. So I didn't concern myself. I didn't tell myself that I knew anything about American Indian. And I think he appreciated that. Because as it turned out, he'd interviewed three previous writers and they'd all tried to argue with him. Before he let me go, he asked me if I was a Christian. And I had to say that I wasn't. And I asked him why. And he said, the Christians stomp, uh, stole the language from my people, from the, from the Indians. That's true, they forced children into language school, into English language school and punish them for speaking their native language. And he didn't want anything to do with Christians. He's a very opinionated guy. I didn't know how big an asshole he was. He was plenty big. Plenty big. Big as I've ever met. He could be extremely charming. He, he could charm the pants off a waitress. I saw him do it more than once. <laughs> he liked waitresses, but he didn't limit himself to waitresses. Uh, he was a sex addict, what can I tell you? I'm skipping way ahead. When we went on our book tour, uh, first you did the publisher's book tour, more about which is later, and then we did our own book tour. And what we did is I lined up uh, speaking engagements at 22 bookstores in California in 12 days. And we drove up the coast to Vallejo, where he spent much of his childhood, and then drove back down to the Central Valley. And along the way, he discovered he had nine more children than he thought he did. <laughs> this is not a joke. It happened the same time, same way, each time. At the very end of the talk, after he'd read from the book and talked and taken questions and signed the books, uh, and we were packing up, and everybody except me and him had gone. A young man or a woman, late teens, early 20s, would show up. They'd look at their feet, which is the polite way for, if you're an Indian, you don't look your elder in the eye. And they'd mumble something like, Mom says you're my dad. 
<laughs> and he was very gentle with them. He'd ask their names. He'd ask their mother's name. He'd speak to them at great length. He'd take their contact information. And finally, when we'd leave, he said, I don't know who that woman is. I never met her. She probably doesn't know who it was, so she told him it was Russell Means. But by the middle of the next day, he would remember her. And then he would give her, give the kid a car or something. He made a lot of money in the time that I was with him, and he was always broke. He was always borrowing money from me. We were supposed to do this book in a year, but he had serious thought, second thoughts about ever doing it. After we signed the contract, and each of us got about eighteen thousand dollars, which was the first installment uh, on a one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar advance. He disappeared for four months. He disappeared for four months. I found him twice. Uh, he was on the set of two different movies. And when I finally got him on the line, he wouldn't talk to me. I said, the clock is ticking. We're supposed to turn a book in in a year. He said, what are they going to do to me? Sue me? I live on an Indian reservation. I live in a trailer that belongs to my wife. Me. I said, wait, they'll sue me too. Ah, he said, that's your problem. <laughs> Russell Means. It gets better <laughs> and worse. I wasn't going to just sit on my hands for four months. I actually didn't know how long it was going to be four months. Uh, I had to do something. So I had been provided with two resources. One of them was a set of newspaper and magazine clippings, anything that had mentioned him for about the last 20 years. Some of it was Lexus, no, Nexus actually. Well, some of it was Lexus too, because a lot of court cases. He'd been arrested uh, 13 times at that point. Uh, no, it was 13 times in one year. A lot he'd been arrested. But anyway, uh, other thing I had was that Murray Fisher had done three long interviews with him and then I decided that he was not the right guy to write a, to write a book that he was a, a better editor than a writer that's when he started looking for somebody else to write and I had those transcribed interviews so I sat down and I made a list of all the places and the approximate dates where something important that had been in the newspaper had happened and then I got on a plane and I flew to uh, Rapid City and I rented a car and put 4,000 miles on it in 15 days. I went as far east as Minneapolis, as far west as uh, the Valley of the Little Bighorn, the Custer uh, site. I talked to four of his ex-wives. He had a current wife, I didn't talk to her then. Our, uh, four of his ex-wives, including one, there was really a marriage in name only, was that he, she could visit him in prison. Uh, I talked to his aunt, who was the last person of her generation in his family, uh, and I talked to two of his sons, including one that was had just escaped from the prison in Sioux Falls and was wanted for murder. But I didn't know it at the time. I just, he, he just asked me to give him a ride to Rapid City, but he was with his other, the younger brother. And about halfway there, I found out he was, uh, he, he had been on a one one day parole and he just left. He just didn't go back. Uh, apparently they, they do that in South Dakota. They let people out if they've had a good disciplinary records for a day or two. Uh, so he just took off. Uh, and then they asked to borrow money from me, so I had to give it to him, of course. They were sitting in the back of my rented car. But it was all part, it was all good. And I found, I, I, I went to look for his mother's grave, his grand, yeah, his mother's grave, uh, in a town of Yankton, which is uh, an Indian reservation that's pretty much been abandoned. And I didn't find it, but I found a uh, 12 foot high treaty obelisk that had the names of all the chiefs that had signed of the Yankton Sioux that had signed the treaty in 1858 and all the guys who had refused to sign, one of them was his 
great, great, great grandfather. And out of that experience, I was able to sit down and write a hundred pages before he ever came back. And I showed them to Murray Fisher and he put his pencil on them and gave them back to me and I fixed his edits. And when Russell came back, he called me, I had no idea he was coming back, and said, okay, let's have our interview, our interview. So I took the hundred pages with me and I went to see him. And I said, in your absence, I have done this, and I explained what I just told you, and I've written a hundred pages. And he blows up. That's not what I wanted you to do. I had an outline. I said, no, I never saw any outline. Yeah, yeah, I can show it to you. Opens his wallet, he gives me a greasy envelope that's been folded 40 times, and it's got a second, third grader, yeah, third grader, topic outline, one, A, B, C, and it starts with grammar school. Uh, and he takes the 100 pages and throws them out the window of his hotel. And I left. Unknowns to me, the next minute after I left, he went down and got the pages. And he put them in back in right order. And he took them to the noted uh, drama critic, Margot Kidder. Who went in his, she's actually a very smart woman. Very bright woman. Also bipolar, but that's a whole other story. Uh, she had been his co-star in one of the movies he was making, and she read the hundred pages and gushed and said, Oh, Russell, I didn't know you could write like this. This is wonderful. <laughs> so, I could talk about him for several hours, but I, I think you get the picture. Uh, he just kept sabotaging himself over and over and over again. Uh, and he kept making me jump through hoops. And, at a certain point, uh, he actually quit the project and it was up to me to get him back because nobody else had as much invested. If I didn't finish this book, I'd have to give the money back. If I didn't give the money back, I'd never get another book contract. And I didn't have the money. But he wasn't actually raised on the reservation. He said he grew up in Vallejo. Well, the question was, was he raised on the reservation? Yes or no? Uh, he grew up on the, he was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation and lived there until he was five. Then when World War II came along, his father got a job in the Sh Mare oh, Island oh, Naval I Shipyard and then he, he moved there. That's all you but uh, he went back and forth visiting family, but he really wasn't a child of the reservation. Right. So um, you are the oldest living TV writer to ever ever broken into the TV writing. I don't I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, so how did you pull that off? Well, I have to stay by, start by saying it was the biggest mistake of my career. <laughs> uh, I had finished a book. I had finished the book with Win Cao Key, his war memoir, uh, memoir called. Buddha's child, and uh, I turned it in on the week, Monday of the week before the 4th of July, I don't remember the date, of 2001. And my editor called me and said, I'm going to be traveling all summer. My editor was, the, was Bob Wilde, the editor-in-chief at uh, St. Martin's Press. Uh, and he said, uh, it might be Labor Day before I get back to you. I'm going to read it a couple of times and I'll have notes for you. So don't call me. You'll be out of town. Uh, I'll get back to you right after Labor Day. So now what am I going to do for the summer? Fish got to swim, birds got to fly. I got to write or take pictures, but something. Uh, something happened to me when I was in the Army. Is, terrible thing, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's not really important to the story, uh, but it was pretty rotten and I thought it might make a movie. Uh, a friend of mine, a softball friend of mine that I've been playing ball with at that point for close to 20 years, uh, I didn't even know his last name at that point, but Larry Mintz. I knew he was a, uh, a, a, a TV writer, and what I didn't know was that uh, when he got to be about 40, they couldn't get arrested in Hollywood. He couldn't, couldn't get any more work. 
He made a lot of money. He, he worked, wrote a lot of sitcoms. But his agent told him to, to reinvent himself. That was all he knew. He knew how to write sitcoms. And in fact, as it turned out, he really didn't know how to write sitcoms. He knew how to tell someone else how to do it. I mean, he really did know how to tell someone else how to do it. Uh, he could listen to a scene and tell you what was wrong with it, but he couldn't tell you how to fix it. He could tell you what was wrong with it. Uh, a, a, a very honorable and, and, and smart man. All I knew about him was that he was a screenwriter and I, I knew nothing about writing for the screen. So at a, at a softball game, I said, Larry, uh, let me take you to lunch. I want to I wanna pitch you something. So we had lunch. And I started up, I said, I'm going to tell you a story. If you think this would be a movie, then I'd like to talk to you about collaborating. If you don't think it's a movie, then fine, we just have lunch. So I told him the story in about five minutes. And he said, the first thing we need is a whole stack of three by five cards. And his, his notion was to do a, an outline on three by five cards. I had electronic three by five cards, which I prefer to use. It's just a little way of putting, it's done on the computer and you just do the notes and you can move them around. So that was how we got started on that. And we did not sell that, uh, maybe it probably won't ever sell it, but it got us an agent. I have to say, uh, an over the hill agent who was uh, in, in her twilight minutes. She was about to become a manager. Manager can participate in the income stream from a production, and agent just gets a commission uh, from whoever he represents or she represents. But anyway, we, for for a few weeks we had an agent, and uh, I, we wrote another one on on spec uh, based on a childhood experience of mine, and that one got optioned by uh, uh, the the Hallmark Channel. And they paid us to rewrite it, and they didn't use it. It's a whole other story, but that's that's the business. And I spent nine years in the business, and I wrote about 15 scripts with Larry, and two of them were produced, and we had another book, one option. And uh, I, I discovered that 63 is not the right age to start the movie business. Uh, no, nobody, no agent wants you. They want somebody in their 20s who has maybe 15 years experience. Uh, <laughs> they, want, they want somebody uh, that they can pee on and tell them that it's raining. And we'll believe it. The problem that, I, that we had when we went to meetings is someone, frankly, young enough to be my son or my, even my grandson, would tell us something that we knew to be untrue and we say, wait a minute, that's bullshit. Uh, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to go to meetings with people their parents' age because people their parents' age are not intimidated by them. So I kind of regret the nine years I spent in the movie business because I could have written five books in that time and made some money. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. All right. Uh, we, we, we're going to have one more question here. Um, and then we're going to do some cake in the back. Cake! Cake. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time because they're going to kick us out fairly soon. So, and it's about five. It is about five. Um, five minutes. Can you tell us the bicycle story in five minutes? Yeah. Can I tell you what? The bicycle story yes. in five minutes? Yes. When I was nine, I had to get a job. My, my father was too sick to work. And... I found a guy in Chicago named Mr. Michelli, uh, who had a paper distribution business, and I asked him if I'd get a paper out, and he said, talk to me for a few minutes, and then he said, show me your bicycle. I said, well, it's at home. I didn't have a bicycle. And I didn't know how to ride a bicycle, and neither of my parents knew how to ride a bicycle, because both of my parents were orphans, and no one ever showed them how to ride a bicycle. But the guy didn't ask to see the bicycle, he just asked, asked me to see me ride the bicycle, he just asked to see the bicycle. So we borrowed a bicycle, and I showed it to him, and I got the job. And for about a week, I put the, the papers up on the handlebars and pushed the bicycle. <laughs> it's not an easy way to do things. My mother then took pity on me and gave me her folding shopping cart, and I delivered from the shopping cart. Now here's the deal, if you're on a bicycle, and you throw in newspapers, one chance. 
He missed. Too bad. Lands in a, in a puddle. Too bad. Missed second point, floor pitch. Too bad. But if you're in a cart, you get all the chances you want. If it's too heavy, a Sunday paper, too heavy to throw up to a third store porch, you carry it up. So, over about uh, a year and a half's time, I built that route from uh, 29 customers to 59 customers. Uh, not because of anything special I did, but just people would stop me in the street and ask to take the paper. It was the Chicago American, which is a Hearst paper. Uh, long gone now. Uh, the, way, the way the business worked for me, for Paper Boys, is that we had to pay for our papers on Friday. And we were paid a penny a paper a day and five cents for the weekend paper, Sunday paper, big Sunday papers. So I would collect on Thursday night. On the Thursday night before Christmas, and this would have been 1950 or 51, 51, uh, I went out and the, uh, my route was two blocks, both sides of the street. I knocked on the first of my customer's door and I heard music inside, but nobody came to the door. So I went on to the next door and nobody was home. And the next door, I'm in the middle of the first block. I haven't found a single customer home. And there are lights on on the block. I see people getting in and out of their cars, coming back from the store shopping, but none of my customers are home. And I'm in a state of panic absolute panic because if I don't pay for my papers I could lose this job and although I was only making about nine dollars a week and all of it except for a dollar which I got to keep went to my my parents uh, I don't want to lose this job you can imagine you know a nine-year-old kid panic I get to the last house in the second block this is my favorite customers it was the Gordons it was a pair of identical Italian twins who were gorgeous. They were not, of course, married to the same man. They were married to two different men. But uh, Mrs. Gordon had downstairs, and her sister was upstairs. So I knock on the Gordon's door. Doors, I hear music and noise and talking, and the door is open, and her husband all but drags me inside. There in her living room are every one of my customers, all of them crammed into the swimming room. And I didn't know what to, what to say. And then Mrs. Gordon came out. She escorts me to the middle of the room and she said, you're the best paper boy we ever had. And she lauds me for five minutes. I'm not gonna spend the five minutes lauding me. <laughs> uh, I didn't good, okay? So she, they, they liked it. And then she said, we've all seen you out there in the rain and the snow with that little shopping cart and we think you ought to have a bicycle and they had pitched in and bought me a bicycle. Wow. Which I had to walk home. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got it home, when I had schlepped it up the stairs, the second floor over the butcher shop, uh, there was a bag, paper bag, and in that paper bag was a card from every one of my customers with their dues and a tip. Oh uh, and it happened, my father had just lost his job again. My father was in the sheet metal business. And there was a little over a hundred dollars in, wow. in tips. It was a fortune in 1950. Oh, yeah. It was a month's pay. A month's pay. Uh, I mean, for a working man, not for me. Yeah. It was a year's right. pay for me. Great stuff. Uh, the next day, I go to work. You have to shut the